Welcome back, Fantasy Fiction Fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today's class is going to be on the last set of chapters for Haru the Ninth. We are finishing from 51 all the way to the end, so it's going to be about four chapters worth of content that we are finishing up with. Um, and it's pretty exciting that we are finally finished with book two. Hopefully you are enjoying this journey as we go through the locked tomb. Um, and I'm pretty interested in what happened in these chapters and how it ended. Just like number one ended pretty intensely, this one also ends pretty intensely. We've kind of had a mirror view of like, okay, book one, you know, we had everything kind of compiling at the end and everything coming together at the end and then like a major ending with, you know, Gideon sacrificing herself so Haro can become a lector. And then we have this one where we're going through the whole thing and suddenly everything is starting to make sense at the end. And then once again, we have both Haru and Gideon seeming like they might be dying. So super, super interesting, super confusing on what's going to happen next. Like, where do they go from here? And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in our class. But let's go ahead and get started since there is quite a bit to talk about, even though it's only the last little bit of the book. So starting with our recap, as always, we start off this chapter kind of already in the middle of some intense moments. Um, and we see Gideon's original thoughts when she was younger about who she was and how, you know, she might have parents that were important and you know, were kind of pushing back against Haru for the way she was being treated and saying like, hey, what if my parents are super important? Um, and just feeling kind of lost because she didn't have a family, she didn't have anybody. Um, and just being very sad about that. And interestingly enough, she was correct. Her parents really were uh, important. At least her dad was the most important person in the world. Um, but she, unfortunately she didn't know that at the time. Um, so. Uh, after we kind of come back to the moment, God is finally really figuring out exactly what's going on, exactly what everybody was planning, exactly who Gideon is, really is fully understanding what's going on. And Mercy and Augustine accuse God of being a liar and not telling them how to actually make a lector where both of them can live because apparently him and his Annabelle Lee have been connected and have swapped eyes, meaning that she must have been fully made, you know, as a him being as a lector with the connection that they made without either of them dying. So they're very, very upset that apparently they didn't have to kill their cavaliers in order to become lectors and that there was some kind of other process that God did not tell them. And Mercy tricks God into being able to be close to him and takes her chance and kills him by shattering him into pieces. So she's triumphant for a moment, at least, that she killed God, that her mission is complete, that they're going to try and rid the world of necromancy and let everybody die. However, it is not long lasting because God does pull himself back together, resurrects himself, however that process may be, but he is back fully into being and kills her immediately. So after that, I can understand why he did not have the best uh, feelings toward everybody, feeling like everyone's betraying him at this point and needed to re-confess um, their fealty to him. I completely understand considering somebody who thought was loyal to him just killed him. Um, and he demands that everybody can be forgiven if they say that they are completely loyal to him and that they will follow him. Gideon the Lector says right away yes. Ian says right away yes. Gideon tries to say no, <laughs> tries to go against him, but he doesn't really count it since she's in Haru's body and it's not Haru. So he's like, I'm not gonna be against you when it's day one, I just met you, uh, and apparently you're my daughter, and also you're in Haro's body and it's not really your choice, it's Haro's choice, so you get a free pass and are just considered good to go. But Augustine says no, he will not 
be loyal to God anymore. And right at that moment, the river ends up starting to break through into the spaceship and there's water filling everywhere and danger is here. So instead of being able to deal with the aftermath of that, they have the water breaking in and only Augustine and God end up being in a tussle and Gideon is trying to figure out what she needs to do. She tries to get to higher ground, she tries to get out of the water, but it's just not working. They are too deep in the river in order for them to get out or to be able to swim away from it. So they're really in a pickle here. And she kind of teams up a little bit with Gideon, um, the lector, who she finds out is actually um, just the cavalier now because Gideon the necromancer died in the fight with the resurrection beast. And she was somehow preserved inside his body, uh, at least somewhat, and is now piloting his body. So her name is Pyra, and she's the one that's now in Gideon the Lector's body. And so Augustine and God are still tussling in the water, and God is almost trapped. He really is on the losing end at this point. He's really struggling. But Ianth is there in time to grab him and pull him out and to save him. Meanwhile, Gideon has kind of made her choice, and there's very limited options, and she is falling further and further into the river and knows that she's going to die. So there she is, sinking to the end, and Haru, in wherever space she is in the river, is also sinking. So there's also water being uh, flooding the place, it's breaking apart, and she ends up coming up for air at the tomb where uh, the body is, or the uh, Annabelle who is supposed to be locked up in the tomb, that slab is there. So she climbs up onto it and sees the two-hander sword. She curls up with it and either goes to sleep or dies. And for, at least for Gideon's portion, the actual body part uh, portion, we do know that there is somebody Possibly the body at least has come to claim Haru and wants to possibly save her if that's even possible. And then in our epilogue, we have some unknown woman who is living somewhere that we don't know, but is being taken care of by a couple of people, one of no one of which is Camilla, since we get that name of Camilla, and Camilla does not know who she is as of yet. And that's where, uh, that's where we end things, is in this particular moment. Okay, now I'd like to go ahead and talk about God. So, in these last couple chapters, everything kind of gets spun around on its head. And one of the main things that this is occurring from is because of God. This whole entire book, we have been building a picture of who God is and what his deal is, I guess you could say, like what it is that's driving him, what his goals are, who he is, why he interacts with people certain ways, his relationships that he has with people. We've really been building kind of a picture of who God is and what's going on with him and why Haru is now with him and why she did this whole thing about trying to become a lector, becoming a lector, and then staying with God and what she is trying to help him with. And now in this moment, we've just had everything kind of turned around and spun upside down because God is not who we have been building him up to be this entire time. So first of all, he is not as vulnerable as he has made everybody believe. The resurrection, the resurrection beasts cannot kill him. He's been hiding in his room, like being locked up, protected by his lectors against these beasts that can't even kill him. So that's been a lie that he's been telling everybody and that really changes the name of the game at this point. He's not as vulnerable as it seems. He is not as vulnerable as he's made other people um, lead him to, or, or Lilla, let me start over. Um, he is not as vulnerable as he has led people to believe that he is. He is been able to be killed and comes right back. So the question is, you know, 
exactly where is the line that he can be killed. We don't even know that at this point, where he can be killed like permanently. Obviously, she did kill him momentarily. Um, he is not actually as nice and forgiving as he seems to be. Not only does he kill Mercy 100% like without any any regard for what he's doing without any um, regret, nothing. He just comes back, instantly murders her, and is like, Kate, business is done. So it's like, he's not as forgiving. He's not as um, nice and close to his lectors as he makes it seem, at least on his end. And I mean, you could always say, I mean, she did murder him, so it's kind of fair play, and I get that. And he is forgiving enough that, hey, he would forgive Augustine if he said that he was loyal to him again and would believe him. But at the same time, we do see this hint of harshness that is coming through now that he has had this happen. So the truth is kind of breaking through and now he has no need to have pretenses or to pretend anything at this point. He's like, okay, cards are out on the table. Are you loyal or are you not? Decide and you'll either be destroyed or you can keep living. Those are the only two options. There is no go away and uh, I just don't need you anymore. Uh, I feel like if he was as forgiving and as kind as he was originally portrayed, then he would say there's that third option of like, hey, I will let you go and you'll never see me again and I'll never see you again. Um, but instead it's either death or loyalty. <laughs> so, I mean... Augustine is very brave to choose death, or at least uh, to choose not being loyal and wants to fight for um, his life, but there isn't really much leeway now in God's mind. It's either you're with me or you're dead. And I feel like that is a lot more harsh than he has been leading people to believe that he is. Um, he also is the one that had Gideon the Lector be trying to murder Haru. And he says that that is because he wanted to help her and to save her, blah, blah, blah. But how is that the case when he already knew, at least I believe he already knew, that Haru altered her own mind and memories in order to forget Gideon? So I feel like he already knew what her problem was. I don't really understand what he thought Gideon attacking her was going to do. It's not really stated, but apparently he's the one that has been sending um, Gideon, the lector, to just try and murder her at any opportunity. And he was hoping that either she would be saved or that death would be kinder for her. And I don't really truly understand what that motivation was, but apparently he's not as fun, loving, and good as it would seem. He also made it seem like he did not want Gideon attacking Haru. He did not condone that and was upset by it. So it's like he's playing this double game, um, flipping sides and, and not letting anybody actually understand his true motivations here. So to me, that's another knockdown of like, who really is this guy and what is actually his motivations and why, why is he doing what he's doing if things are as different as they seem to be now that all the information is out on the table so he's not honest he's not forgiving he's not caring as much as we all thought he has so many things that has just knocked him down a peg and a peg and a peg and I get that people who are supposed to be loyal to him that weren't ending up being loyal to him kind of made this situation occur but if that was truly his nature the way that we had been seeing him then I think things would have turned out differently so it also makes me wonder how Augustine and Mercy Morn decided to betray him. Did they see this side of him? Did they know that he could be like this? Exactly what led all of this to this point? And this is all just super important because it changes everything that we have built this book. You know, we've we built through number one, like kind of the rules of this world and what's going on in it and that kind of stuff. We've built a base. And then we had that base turned upside down and kind of scrambled around with how crazy the beginning of this book is for the first, you know, 70% of the book. It's kind of crazy going on everywhere. And the only things that we can really hold on to are the things that we are building and the knowledge that we are gaining 
based on our interactions with the characters in this story. God being one of the main ones, being one of the most important ones. And then now we are at this end point where everything that we thought was true, everything that we had built to this point is now being slashed down. We've got God is no longer who he says he was. We've got, you know, the fact that Gideon is now revealed to be God's daughter. We've got um, the fact that he's been lying about a lot of things. He has not been telling them the truth on exactly how lecturhood is and what the truth of the world is at this point. He hasn't even been telling the truth about the resurrection beasts and saying like, oh, I mean, obviously he's correct in that they have to kill the beasts because they might kill others and might be really harmful, but he could technically fight. And instead he's building more lectors and, you know, Haro became a lector because he needed new lectors in order to fight them. And yet he is in, uh, not able to be killed by them. So there's been so many things that he has come up with in this moment where everything is lacking and everything is turned upside down and now the possibilities of what is capable and who this person is is completely changed, completely different than we are expecting. And we've really shifted our gears now, especially with there being a book three. It's going to change how we progress into that next book. Next, let's go ahead and talk about world building. So in this last couple of chapters, we actually do have some interesting world building. And it's unique in the fact that it's world building through finding out where we were misinformed instead of, you know, like something that we didn't know. So we have the main focus of this world building is how to make a lector and what a lector is. And we do know the basics of it that hasn't changed but what has changed is the idea of it being so clear cut that you kill your cavalier you absorb their energy make them a part of you and then you become a lector because we have found that you don't have to kill your cavalier in order to become a lector so there are more options then we're given to Haru and Anth and the others that were at the uh, Canaan house and they didn't even know it. Not that, you know, everybody tried to become a lector, but either way, um, they did have more options that were not available to them there at the house. And that has now affected our view of what is possible in this world and what might happen in the future. So. God apparently has a cavalier who is still alive and just locked up and sleeping, I guess is what the consensus of what this set of chapters has given us. Um, we believe that in the tomb is locked his cavalier because they wanted her to be murdered because they guess they thought that she was crazy or something was just wrong. She's like a monster or something, but really she is god's cavalier and he has merely imprisoned her in that tomb instead of killing her and they both live even though um they are you know he's a full lector or has that abilities i mean he has god so it's kind of hard to say exactly what he had before that but both of those people were still alive and around and for that whole length of time everyone thought that they had their own eyes but really the eyes that were originally theirs were swapped between them. And so they were looking at others with the other person's eyes. Annabelle Lee had God's eyes and God has Annabelle Lee's eyes. I think that is something super interesting about the way that lecterhood works is that you absorb the other person and then that person's soul is shown with having the other person's eyes. Obviously that didn't happen to Haro because she separated herself from Gideon. But the other lectors do have that where they end up having the cavalier's eyes, their eyes change to whatever their cavaliers look like. And it's kind of interesting because they always say that the soul, you can see somebody's soul through their eyes and maybe that has something to do with it. I uh, don't really know, it wasn't confirmed, but you are observing somebody else's soul and so maybe now that soul is represented in the eyes. Um, but I do think overall that that's just super interesting, that whole concept. Um, and it even shows that in some ways the whole point of not having that cavalier die is possibly 
uh, already taking place with most electors, possibly, possibly not. Um, most of them have died and not had any of their cavaliers come back, but Gideon, the necromancer part of him, died. And yet Pyra, his cavalier, was preserved in some way inside him, and now she is controlling the body, and now she is still alive and uh, is running around. So this whole possibility of the cavalier not having to die, of the cavalier being able to pilot the body when the necromancer is no longer at the forefront there, the whole process of everything going on right now is very interesting. And it does lead me to wonder what the possibilities of that is further. I mean, the ghost said before to Haru that there was no way to save Gideon, that the second she goes back to her body, Gideon will be no more. But is that really the case? If we can have two cavaliers, or not two cavaliers, a cavalier and a um, necromancer gain lecterhood, but switch the energy, like, you know, you don't have to fully die and be absorbed, that you're both still okay, is it possible that Gideon can be removed? If the fact that, you know, Pyra lasted for thousands of years inside Gideon's body, does that mean that there is a way to extract that soul again and place it somewhere else in another body? It's tough to say at this point, but it does open those possibilities. So we've got the world building and the fact that we are building new possibilities. We are changing the name of the game and we are moving forward with new information that is now broadening the scope of this world and what is possible and seeing what we can move forward with. Um, so it's really, really interesting and it's very interesting that it's happening right at the tail end of this book. Normally most of the world building happens throughout the beginning, throughout the middle, you know, a little bit at the end, but not usually right at the end and more we're working on our climax and exactly what's happening at the end. But this book is still building possibilities and building our knowledge all the way to the very last pages. Now let's go ahead and start talking about our transition to the next book as well as the ending of this book. So it's kind of an interesting concept that we have going on here because we're being left on a little bit of a cliffhanger when it comes to our main characters, Gideon and Haru. We are left with them seemingly to die again. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously we knew that Haru lived before, but we thought Gideon had died, even though it seems that she hasn't. Um, and we have another moment where it's like the end is coming and now both of them seem to be falling into this end. But we do have that moment of um, Annabelle Lee or the body or whatever you want to call it at this point. Um, being there and trying to revive her. Um, whether that actually was just a psychotic break, a part of Haru's mind that is showing through, whether that is actually really there. And I mean, it'd be interesting. You'd think that the, the body would still be locked up in the tomb, but maybe she escaped and is coming for her. I don't, we don't know. <laughs> I, there's only so many possibilities I can think of, but it does seem like there is a possibility that she could be saved. Um, both of them could be saved because if you save Haru, and then you save Gideon, and if you save Gideon, then you save Haru. So there is this possibility that the end has not come yet. However, the author does say we died and she either fell asleep or she died or both. So there is that possibility that they died and there is that possibility that they were saved. And if Haru's body was saved, how is Haru going to come back to her body considering she's kind of floating out in the river, uh, not really attached at this point. So we've really kind of left on a little bit of a cliffhanger, not fully a cliffhanger because we do have something that happens afterward, but a cliffhanger in terms of Haru and Gideon and their fate. So I do think that's super interesting that we are leaving it here. Um, it also presents kind of an interesting transition because we are unsure of if either our main characters that we have had at this point, even though both have been narrated by Gideon, Haru was really the main character through most of 
the second book. So kind of our main characters here, we've got the two of them, might both be gone. And that would be very interesting. It's like, how are we setting up all of this just for them to no longer exist? That, well, to have died, not that they didn't exist at all, but to have died and not be part of the story anymore. Super interesting idea, um, but it does mean that we're gonna have to wait for the next book in order to see how that uh, rounded out and how that was resolved, whether they really are gone or whether they are both alive. And if they are both alive, does that mean that when Haro comes back that Gideon is no longer alive? We do know that it is possible on a smaller extent um, to have them both alive even without Gideon not remembering Haru, or, or sorry, without Haru not remembering Gideon and not having all that, um, having to be redone to her mind. Um, but we do have a really good setup for the next book. We do have a smooth transition because we have this ending that's a cliffhanger. Tamsin has tagged on this epilogue. And so that is going to be our transition to our next book. I have read the synopsis for the next book since it is coming out later in the year. And it does seem like we are being set up, being uh, kind of linked together at the end of this book, linking us to the beginning of the next book with this mysterious um, girl who is being looked after by Camilla and a couple others, though we do not know exactly who those others are or where they are at. But we do have this little link, this little transition that Tamsin is giving us from our cliffhanger moment to our next book. And so we are having a solid framework, a solid link to going from point a to point B for each book. We are gonna just kind of glide along and hopefully hop into this next story that is being set up. So it's pretty interesting that we've had this whole framework of like what this book for book two is about. We've got it where it's all linked to the Emperor's death. And the Emperor's death does occur, though in not the way we would expect. We do feel like, oh, maybe it's with the Resurrection Beast. And that's kind of how we've been lining it up throughout the whole process of this book. It's like, okay, the Resurrection Beast is going to come, the Resurrection Beast is going to come, the Resurrection Beast is going to come, and you have to save God. God must be protected at all times. But it isn't the Resurrection Beast at all that has to do with God's death. It has to deal with Mercy Morn and his fellow lectors who are supposed to be protecting him, actually turning against him and killing him. Um, so, and it is also interesting that we get to that point, and even at the end with the epilogue it says six months after God's death, is that it happened and yet it didn't happen at the same time. He did die, but he's not dead. He has come back and he is not able to be killed that easily. So super interesting that we had this framework for this whole novel. It happened, but it didn't happen in the way people expected. At least I'm assuming, maybe you guessed it, and I would love to know if you did guess that. Um, and then we have this nice little link at the end that's tagging us to the beginning of our next book. So really kind of nice, even though we've kind of had crazy exotic moments at the beginning with the second person point of view, with everything being unknown, not knowing what happened with Gideon and Haru's being out of whack. I had this whole adventure happening. We've got our answers. We've seen that Gideon's still alive. We back strongly with our Gideon character. And then we have this cliffhanger where we don't even know if our main characters exist anymore. And then we've kind of tied it all up with this link that's gonna transition us into book three. And we're gonna see what we're being led to. At this point, I feel like it's interesting that we have no real clue about what the end result is. We don't really know what Haru and Gideon's destiny is, if they have one, and if they don't, what was the whole point of all that? <laughs> and two, like, what is going to be the what, what are we reaching for in this series i feel like that's something that has not yet been addressed we are not sure what the end result we're looking for is and a lot of stories you understand at least at some point what the end result this story is reaching towards 
um, or what the story is thinking through the whole series is reaching towards. For example, our other story we're currently covering right now, the Belgarid, the whole series is reaching towards the fight between Torak and Garion. In this one, we're kind of left being like, I got no idea what's going on. I don't know where we're going, but we're on this ride and we're going for it. So it'll be really interesting to see where we are going next and what we are building towards in this next particular book. I'd love to know your thoughts and your feelings about any of these topics that relate to uh, this book that we are finishing up, anything that has been happened before. We'd just really love to hear your thoughts on where you think we're going as well. And last but not least, let me go ahead and just cover our nitty gritty really quick. Um, I don't have too much, I just have two things that I would like us to keep in mind or to think about a little bit as we move on to book three. Um, and the first one is, is that how, is Haru actually, um, I am stating this really wrong. Let me back up a second and start over that question. Did Haru actually open the tomb after all? And if so, was it because Gideon was there? Is that what allowed her to open the tomb and go inside? Because God has said that it's literally been not possible. Um, that without him there, it is not possible for anybody to open the tomb. But I truly believe that, Gide uh, that Haru did. And I wonder if Gideon being in her life is the way that she was able to. I mean... Gideon, they made it seem like she had to die in order for the tomb to open, but I feel like there's more to Gideon than meets the eye. I actually think it's very interesting that Gideon was not a necromancer um, because she is God's daughter, so that's super interesting that she's not actually a necromancer. Um, and maybe that is part of her existence then is able to transition to opening that tomb. I don't really know. I was just something I had a thought on and I would like to keep in mind as we move forward is that maybe uh, maybe Haru really did open that tomb and I truly strongly believe that she did um, and that that probably had something to do with Gideon and maybe that will come in the future as well. Maybe going back to the ninth. Um, we're not really sure. Uh, at this point though, Gideon doesn't have her own body, so it might be a little different for that, uh, this case. We'll, we'll find out more about that, but that's something that I just would like us to keep in mind and think about. Maybe I could hear your thoughts if you have any thoughts on that. And second, uh, is, has Annabelle Lee, um, or Lecto, or any of the other names that she has been called, actually escaped from the tomb or not. So is that the fact that Annabelle Lee was coming for Gideon, as well as the whole symbolism of Haru climbing up into an empty tomb with just holding on to the two-hander, mean that Annabelle Lee has actually escaped the tomb or not? I think that'll be super interesting, especially because technically Annabelle Lee is supposed to be God's undoing and will kill him. So depending on the context, it could be that just because that could be the end of God because if Annabelle Lee dies, then he will also die considering they are linked as a lector cavalier thing. I'm not really sure what you call them once, you know, you become a lector with a cavalier that's still alive. Um, but whatever that link is, maybe that will transfer his life force to Annabelle Lee, and if Annabelle Lee dies, then God does. Like, fully? Hard to say on that. But I do think it's interesting that it is a possibility that Annabelle Lee might have escaped based on what we have been given, and I would really love to find out in the next book if that is the case. And that is all I had for our wrap-up discussion of Haru the Night. I hope you guys enjoyed talking about this book just as much as I have um, for all the way from book one to book two and of course we will talk about book three however it is not out currently as uh, it is coming out at the end of this year so we will be transitioning on to something new uh, until that time comes where we can come back and talk about it some more with book three 
but I'd love to hear your thoughts, your feelings about the first two books as we've discussed them so far or anything that I have discussed in this particular class. I'd just love to hear your thoughts and opinions. The next book that we will be going for or the next series that we'll be doing some in-depth discussions on is the Rain Benares series by Lisa Sheeran. The first book is called Magic Lost Trouble Found and it is a high fantasy and it is lots of fun and I hope that you will enjoy reading it with me. It's one of my favorite series and I'm really excited to go ahead and talk about it with you. So hopefully you will join me for that series um, and then once the next book comes out, once we have a stopping place um, or a transitioning place to go back to it, we will go ahead and talk about book three. So don't be worried if you are really hoping that I'll do book three. I will come back to it, I promise. We will go ahead and talk about the locked tomb some more in the future. Before we go ahead and finish out today's class, let's go over the trivia question. Thank you so much, as always, to everyone who participated. I really appreciate you playing with me. And I guess this week's question was pretty hard because I had a lot of uh, people who answered, but I didn't have too many correct answers. Only one person got this answer correct. Um, the question was, uh, in Jim Butcher's Harry Dresden Files, what does the Black Court vampires take from humans? And the answer is fear. So uh, most of my answers were uh, the answer of blood, which makes sense considering that most uh, vampire stories have vampires uh, taking blood from their human victims. But in this case, only the red court vampires take blood from their victims. The black court takes fear. And that is what they sustain themselves on. So congratulations to Kathy, who got the answer correct. Um, and to everybody else, thank you so much for answering and giving it your best shot. Hopefully uh, you can find the answer to the next question and we'll be able to answer and get it right. If you would like to join the trivia question, you can head over to the blog, fantasyfictionfanatics.net. If you're on desktop, it's gonna be on the right-hand side. You'll have to scroll down just a little bit in order to see the question. If you're on mobile, you'll have to scroll almost all the way down to the bottom in order to find the question. I'd be happy to have you play with me and to see your answers. And I really appreciate all of you who are ready to play with me. And while you're over at the blog, if you'd like to check out more content from me, there is more over there with blog posts, with book reviews, book recommendations. Um, I talk about different things about fantasy and reading and my thoughts and feelings on those. I've got some personal posts over there about personal interactions for me for reading and for fantasy, as well as you know fantasy terminology and just other uh, types of content like that. So if you're interested in those, head over to the blog and you are welcome to see them there. And hopefully you'll find something that you enjoy. That's gonna be it for me today. If you would like to get a hold of me and down below in the comments is not the best place. You are more than welcome to find me also on Twitter, which is at fantasyfiction1. You're also welcome to find me on Facebook at slash fantasyfiction1. Uh, I do post updates whenever I upload anything over there, as well as do take messaging if you would like to message me directly. Um, if you'd like to join our uh, Discord, that would be wonderful because we already have several fanatics over there talking and discussing fantasy and books and other exciting things that you might enjoy discussing as well. The link for that will be down below and we'd love to have you over there discussing things. And also you can direct message me over there as well if you need to get a hold of me. So I hope that you will join us and we'd be happy to have you join the FFF community. All right, I think that's it for me today, and I'll see you guys in the next class. Bye.